Welcome to the Great Detectors of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectors.net. Uh, give us a call, 208-991-4783, and become one of our friends on Facebook. Uh, Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Uh, well, we're going to let you know, first of all, that this episode of The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio is brought to you by the support of our listeners. Thank you so much for all of your support, and I especially want to thank uh, today uh, David, who sends along a very nice donation. Uh, thank you so much for your support out there in Florida, and I will be sending along access to our premium side. All right, well, now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, this one is called The Enoch Arden Matter. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Henry Grant, Johnny. You read your morning paper yet? I'm on page four in my second donut. Well, turn back to page one. Pick it there, Mrs. Frank Loring. Oh, I read it. Enoch Arden divorce decree. Husband missing seven years, New York court declared him legally dead. So? So? And this court decision means you'll have to pay off? Within ten days. Something make you think Loring isn't as dead as he ought to be? It's a possibility. I had a phone call a little while ago from a woman up in Boston. She saw the item, too. Well, what's her connection? She's a nurse. Ten years ago, when we issued the Loring policy, she was working for the physician who examined him. Now, her story may not mean anything, but, well, I asked her to take the first plane she could get and come in for a talk. She uh, should be here by uh, 11 o'clock. I'll grab a cab and come right over. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Hemispheric Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Enoch Arden matter. Expense account item one, 50 cents, cab fare to your home office, where Henry Grant provided me with a complete file of previous investigations and police reports covering the disappearance of Frank Lawrence. I was about halfway through them when Grant came in with an attractive woman in her early 30s. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, I want you to tell him exactly what you told me on the phone this morning. Well, anything else you may have thought of on the way down here. Well, I don't really know whether I've anything to tell. You worked for the doctor who examined Loring when his policy was issued? Yes, Dr. Felton. That was in New York. I'd just gotten out of training. It's my first job. I was only there three months, and I went into the army during the war. Mm-hmm. And since the war, I've worked in Boston, the Hayward Clinic. I... Uh, well, I, I feel sort of foolish saying all this. I'm probably wrong. But you think she saw Loring in Boston, Johnny? When? Well, about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago yesterday. Where? At the clinic. Look, really, I'm not sure about... You're not this. hurting anybody, Miss Loring. Suppose you just tell us and we'll take it from there. Well, as I said, it, it was two weeks ago. A man came to the clinic. He wanted to be vaccinated. You give his name? Yes. But it wasn't Frank Loring. He gave the name of Michael Walsh. I thought he looked familiar, but I couldn't face him. What was the reason for the vaccination? He needed an international certificate of vaccination, required by law for anybody going abroad. Oh, he was leaving the country? Well, I guess so. He wanted a certificate. 
I administered the vaccine. He came back five days later, and the doctor entered the result on his card and signed it. That's oh. all I know. What made you connect this Michael Walsh with Frank Loring? I really don't know. I didn't until this morning. I remember thinking I'd seen him before, and then when I saw that story this morning about Mrs. Loring, the name just came into my mind. You'd only seen Loring once, ten years ago? Yes. But as I said, it was my first job, and I, I was impressed at the time having him for a patient. Why impressed? Well, I knew he was an actor. I'd seen a couple of shows he was in, read his name in town, things like that. Did this Michael Walsh look like Frank Loring? Do you remember him? No. He didn't. I, I can't explain it. Well, it seems you could try anyhow, you know. Wait a minute, Grant. Let's not chuck it out so easily. I've been reading this file on Loring. Played a lot of character roles. Expert on dialects and makeup. A man like that could change his appearance very easily. Something about him, the way he moved, the tone of his voice. Something registered with this girl. He'd have recognized her, too, when he went to the clinic. She was impressed with him. She had a reason to remember. He didn't. I, I feel a little foolish. And I feel a little curious. How about you, Grant? I've been curious all morning. I'm curious, I've checked the steamship and airline. And? And a man named Michael Walsh sailed on the SS Castillo six days ago. She runs between Boston and San Diego, Chile. You know when she reaches the Panama Canal? Yeah, the day after tomorrow. Plenty of time for you to get down there by air. Yeah, with enough to spare for a stopover in New York and a chat with Mrs. Loring. <laughs> Expense account item two, $11.30. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford, Connecticut and the Greenwich Village section of New York, where Mrs. Frank Loring was living in up bohemian fashion. It was evening and the party was in full swing when I arrived. The apartment door was wide open, so I just walked in. Somebody shoved a glass into my hand like they used to do it at the local movie houses on dish nights. Wow. You must be Linda's boyfriend. Oh, must I? I knew it the minute I saw you. She always goes for the same type. Musician, aren't you? They always are. What do you play? Ring Olivio and double on Partizzi. <laughs> oh, a funny one, eh? Well, Linda said when you got here to tell you the benefit is going to run late, so make yourself comfy and wait. She won't be here until 12. I'm Freddy. You must be a poet. How did you know? I'm psychic. Now, what's the party for? Oh, Marsha's celebrating. She's going to get a quarter of a million dollars. Just because her husband, Frank, disappeared. She ought to be happy enough just to be rid of him. Don't be so bitter, lad. It'll throw your rhymes out of meter. I helped her get over him. I helped her. Anytime she wanted anything, all she had to do was call little Freddy. Now she's getting all that money and she'll just run out. Oh, she wouldn't do that to you, would she? Oh, no. That's how much you know about women. <laughs> She's going to Chile, South America. Oh, well, now that's an interesting bit of information, Freddy. She thinks I don't know about it. The airline called to confirm her reservation while she was out shopping this afternoon. Uh, which one of those lovely ladies uh, is Marsha Loring? Those? Hmm. <laughs> she doesn't look like any of them. Marsha's out in the kitchen fixing sandwiches. She needn't think she'll get any help from me. Oh, maybe I can lend a hand. Listen, mister, you've got a girl coming. Oh, oh, sure, Linda. Well, uh, she told me to give Marsha a message. Uh, besides, you don't want to talk to me. It interferes with your brooding. I'll see you later, Frank. Well, hello, come in. I'm making sandwiches for the starving multitude. I know, I came in to help. How are you on opening bottles? Champagne? But for those peasants, beer. It's, it's right there. They open us on the hook. Oh, we're in business. What are you, a party crasher, or did you come with one of the girls? A crasher? Well, the breed is improving. We uh, both know some of the same people, though. Like who? Who's been hiding you from me? Fellow up in Boston. I don't know anyone in Boston. Not even Michael Walsh? Get out of here. Now, listen, Mrs. Loring. I said get I... out. You weren't invited here. You don't belong here, so... What is it, Marshal? What happened? What did he do? Keep your rompers on, Shakespeare. I told you not to bother her. You, you music. Look out, Freddy! Oh, no. I 
came out of it lying on the cold stone of a basement areaway. Then I went in search of a diner, a telegraph office. Expense account item three, 80 cents for breakfast and aspirin. Item four, a dollar twenty for a telegram, advising that payment of the Loring claim be delayed until my investigation was completed. Item five, seven dollars and sixty cents, cab fare to the international airport. And item six, four hundred fifteen dollars, plane fare and incidentals to the city of Colon, Panama Canal Zone. As usual, it was raining in Colon. The SS Castillo had reached port slightly ahead of schedule. I was waiting to go through the locks when I made my way aboard. It was almost midnight. I located the name of Michael Walsh on the passenger list posted in the lounge, and then made my way to the inside cabins on B deck. I knocked on the door of cabin B64. There was no answer. May I help you, Sheen? You the cabin steward? Looking for the passenger who occupies this cabin. Oh, Senor Walsh is not here. He's gone ashore. And this downpour? See? Look. Here's five bucks. All you have to do for it is to bring me the biggest towel you can find and open this cabin so I can wait inside. Oh, Senor. Well, if you are waiting for Senor Walsh, he will not be there. Why not? He's booked through to Santiago. When he went ashore an hour ago, he took his baggage with him. I helped him with it. You know where he went? He was most anxious to get ashore as soon as our lines were fast. I see. Ship's wireless take any kind of cablegram for him in the past 24 hours? See, si, si. I delivered one to him in the middle of last night. He was more surgeon, I think. He seemed most concerned. Yeah. I knew that Frank Loring, alias Michael Walsh, wasn't going to be easy to find. Away from the ship, he was likely to have a third name. And since he was an expert with dialects, there was every chance he'd adopt a different nationality. I thought about it as I made my way through the narrow, rain-swept streets. I seemed to be the only man without shelter in all of Panama. But I wasn't. Do you have a match, senor? Huh? Oh, I hardly see you. Yeah, yeah, I got a match. I doubt it was the light of this rain. Uh Uh-huh. You don't appreciate the rain, senor? In the rain, I always get what I want. The turistas, they never refuse Jose. Hey, that isn't a cigarette in your hand. No, senor. It is a gun. You join me in the doorway, no? Well, I'd rather die than say no. Now... If the senor has some little thing he wishes to give Jose for a gift, Jose will be most grateful. I don't have much cash, but his wristwatch is worth a couple hundred. Oh, see. Si. Oh, that's a very nice one. I will like that. He bent his head slightly to look at the watch, and his gun hand dipped automatically. I brought my hands up to undo the watch strap, stepped quickly to the side, and let Jose have a left in the solar plexus. <laughs> Now, drop it. Very well, senor. If you insist. That's better. You are... You are going to turn me over to the police, senor? Well, that depends. Oh, senor. The jail here is very bad. Jose does not like it. I'll tell you what. You help me and I'll help you. What kind of help does the senor need? Suppose the police or somebody were after me. Suppose I had to get out of here without using my passport. How would I do it? From Colón? There is no way, senor. Too many Americano officers... There must be some way out. Thirty miles down the coast is Puerto Bello, senor. It was once the hiding place for pirates. In Puerto Bello is a cafe called the Geisha Girl. The Geisha Girl? Si. And the proprietor is senor Kamamoto in Japanese. <laughs> he is very good at making people disappear. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. 
The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account item seven. Twenty dollars, flat rate. The native taxi that slithered its way down the miserable, muddy road to Porto Bello, Caribbean stronghold of the old-time pirates. It was a port of intrigue, an international black hole, a Western Hemisphere counterpart of Shanghai, or Calcutta, or Suez. And at the bottom of the hole was the Geisha Girl Cafe. <laughs> uh, you look lonesome, Mike. Maybe it's because I want to be. I don't know you, and you don't know me. Let's keep it that way. Now, that ain't no way to be. Especially here in Porto Bello, where we're all friendly, like. Uh, you looking for Tamamoto? What are you, a cop? Well, I've been a lot of things, Governor. Never a cop. You may have start on a little trip and forget your passport. Let's say I lost it. What are you doing? Running a private embassy? Yeah, I'm sort of a missionary for people in trouble. You look like I'm in trouble. I've talked to Kamamoto about that. Where is he? Try the storeroom back there. Uh, it ought to be worth the price of a drink, eh? Thanks. Here, drown yourself. It's nice of you, Governor. Kamamoto? Ow. Hey. Anybody in here? Matches. Oh. I came to in a room filled with packing cases and lit by feeble candles. Two men were seated on a couple of small barrels. One of them was the Cockney who had spoken to me in the bar. The other was a Japanese. Uh, how did you know my name? Did it all the head on him? Well, uh, there was some money which I uh, would find most useful. And you were telling me that amount required to pay for your uh, passages to them. Over a thousand dollars? Pretty high fare. I, uh, I am a terrible man. My rates are based upon uh, what my passengers can afford to pay. An unscheduled uh, ship line is expensive to operate. Uh, uh, so you will be taken aboard the uh, Kiramatsu uh, shortly. You will see that you're following them. For where? Uh, the coffee shop is somewhere in uh, South America. Venezuela, Africa, or Brazil. I'm not your only passenger. No, 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 no. Well, uh, how about uh, untying me? Or with friends? Well, now, uh, are you uh, will be untied when you reach your uh, destination? Oh, now, wait a minute. I can see the point here where... Somebody might give you away, but why aboard ship? Well, uh, the fugitives from the law are uh, a risky cargo, Mr. Dollar. The uh, South American nations are rather uh, thorough about their coastal patrol. So, uh, if you are tied up, we can meet certain... Uh, call. What do you mean, Camelot? 
telling the children, you want hot cargoes, Delana. I'm the only way to carry hot cargoes to be certain that you can uh, uh, dispose of it in an emergency. <laughs> if we are challenged by a patrol vessel, uh, you will be uh, weighted down and thrown uh, overboard. <laughs> It was dark when they carried me aboard and left me still trussed in the deck cabin. Then the Kira Matsu pitched and rolled her way into the open sea. I knew that Loring was on board someplace, and I knew something else. Kamamoto had lied to the Cockney about what he found when he searched me. He had more than a driver's license. He had my insurance company credentials and my passport. Then the door opened and I got something else to think about. Buenos dias, Senor Dollar. Jose, how did you get here? <laughs> After you left me, I ran into another Americano with no dress watch but much money. <laughs> he was kind to me. He gave me money to leave the country when I told him about the bad jails. Well, how come Kamamoto is letting you run loose? <laughs> you are the only one who is tied up, Senor. I do not think they intend for you to finish the trip. Hmm. Uh, how many other passengers are there? Besides us, three. A man and a woman came just before we sailed. That's two. Who's the other one? A man, a man with a white suit and a hat. A Cockney accent? What is that? It sounded like an Englishman. Oh, yes. He is English. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. How many in the crew? Kamamoto and five seamen. It is a very small boat. Yeah, yeah, I can feel that. Look, Jose, I gave you a break with the police. How about giving me one? I'm a businessman, senor. No sentiment. A thousand dollars. Guaranteed by an American insurance company. You cut these ropes and lend me your gun. Cash, senor. No credit. Too much book. I haven't got any cash. Kamamoto took it all. Too bad. Maybe next time. There isn't going to be any next time for me. Ever buy a sweepstake ticket? See? Si. Well, take a chance on me. Come on. How about it? All right. Well, when is the time for the drawing? To see if my ticket wins. As soon as you get these ropes off. Let's do it now. This tub may get to my stop any minute. Jose cut the ropes and gave me his gun. There was an oil slicker hanging behind the cabin door, and I slipped it on for cover. The crew on deck was too busy to be counting noses in the storm. I edged my way forward to the main cabin, grasped the door handle, and crashed in. Dollar! Now, let's not get jumpy, anybody. I'm wet and I'm mad, and I've been pushed about as far as I go. Well, good for you, Governor. Glad to see you up and about. You can drop the accent, Loring, and stop flexing your fingernails, Freddy. Now, what's the matter, Marcia? You get too nervous to stay home and fix sandwiches? I didn't have to stay. My lawyers can collect for me. Now what? Loring looks pretty alive to me, even with that Cockney accent. I'm more alive than you're going to be. Don't be a fool, Loring. You're more of a clay pigeon than I am. You've been practicing for the part for seven years. What are you talking about? You think you're going to get to spend any of that insurance money? You think I'm not? Ask Freddy. How about it, Freddy? I don't know anything. I just came with Marsha because she asked me to. Freddy's a nice boy, Loring. He writes poetry. And he'll do anything Marsha asks him to. Won't you, Freddy? What are you trying to do? Wait a minute. I want to hear this. Yeah, you ought to, before your hearing stops altogether. Maybe you've been dead for seven years, but your widow hasn't been putting flowers on your tombstone. You stop talking about Marsha. You see, Loring, Freddy gets mad when I talk about Marsha. Freddy loves Marsha, don't you, Freddy? Yes. You ever take a look at his eyes, Loring? If Marsha said the word, he'd put a knife in you in a minute. Think it over, mister. Michael Walsh turns up dead in South America, and Mrs. Frank Loring and friend Freddy go back to Greenwich Village with a quarter of a million bucks. Only this time, they'd have nothing to worry about. Don't listen to him, Frank. Why not, Angel? He sounds like a pretty smart guy. We've waited seven years for this. You think I'd have anything to do with this little idiot? I've used him, that's all. Marsha, you see, Freddy? she get rid of you, too, after a while. <laughs> There'll always be somebody else coming along to open the beer bottles. I was kind of wondering how Freddy got in on this little trip. I was wondering why we kept something between ourselves for seven years and then you spill it to him. I was frightened, Frank. I knew Dollar was after you. That's why I wired you. I 
couldn't come down here alone until I was sure we'd be together. We'll be together, and we'll stay together until the money comes. Then maybe I'll have some ideas of my own. Give up, Loring. You're never going to get that money. Yes, I am, Donna. Hamamoto standing right behind you, the curtain between this cabin and the next room. Well, don't uh, swim, Mr. Donna. Now, let me have that gun. All right, Kamamoto. Now let's get rid of him. Oh, of course, Mr. Murray. Why, Kamamoto? Why don't we bargain a little first? I'm afraid you are not in the uh, bargaining position. How much is he going to give you for dropping me? You'll get five grand, Dollar. Oh, you're dealing with a real cheapskate, Kamamoto. I'm worth more than that. I could shut you up right here. Please, you... Mr. Murray. Oh, thank you, gentlemen, speak. I do not use that gun unless I see something. This is my ship. You took my credentials before, Kamamoto. You know who I am. Yes, how much did Loring tell you he was going to collect? He's stalling, Kamamoto. To get rid of him. I warned you, Mr. Loring. I will decide who leaves the ship, and when, and how. Suppose you tell me the amount of the policy, Mr. Loring. A quarter of a million dollars. He's lying. It's only 25000 Is it, Loring? i tell you what I'll do then, Kamamoto. Put us both ashore back in the canal zone, where I can get him into the hands of American authorities... And my company will pay you $25,000. And I'll make it $50,000, Kamamoto. $50,000. I bid sixty. Do I hear seventy? Come on, Loring. Bid. I can go the whole quarter million. Won't cost my company any more either way. I'll kill you, dollar. Oh, no. <laughs> Loring and Kamamoto fired at the same time. Both of them were hit, but only Kamamoto went down. Loring turned to Marcia. You wanted him. You can go together. <laughs> All right, Dollar. That ends everything. Now I'm around to you for sure. Oh, I wouldn't count on it, Loring. This time I've got a friend in the doorway. What he said is true, Senor. Senor Kamamoto was no longer using his gun, so I took it. Besides, you have only one bullet left. I have five. You kill Mr. Dollar, and I will have to kill you. You're cooked, Loring. Your wife's dead. You couldn't even get the money if you could get away. All right. Here. You can have it. Come on, to hit me in the side. It hurts. Maybe I can patch it up a little. You better just rip your shirt. I loved her. She always wanted things more than an actor could give her. Whose idea was it? Hers. I hit out like a dog. She sneaked up to Boston to see Maybe once every six months after the first year. The rest of the time I was without her. I guess she wasn't lonely. Yeah. Some women never are. And that about finished it. Expense account, item eight. Sixty dollars, miscellaneous expenses. Expense account item nine, one thousand dollars as promised to Jose. Item ten, four hundred twenty-one dollars and eighty cents. Plane fare and incidental expenses from Colon, Panama Canal Zone, back to Hartford. Total expenses, eighteen hundred and seventy-nine dollars and eighty cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment... Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum... Stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Joel Murcott with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were Stacey Harris, 
Jeanette Nolan, Sidney Miller, Mary Jane Croft, Elliot Reed, John McIntyre, and Howard McNear. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Welcome back. Well, it's somewhat ironic. The missing actor uh, was uh, known for his ability to do great uh, dialect work. And we saw it here uh, in this uh, radio program. Just so many dialects on display. Uh, and other than perhaps the Japanese accent, they were all uh, extremely well done. Uh, and they did such a great job just creating these individual characters. And radio's character actors, they were simply the best. These guys, they didn't make a ton of money. Uh, they perhaps, uh, you don't know their names, but they managed to create these absolutely amazing characters uh, and just to play, you know, thousands upon thousands of different performances. Uh, and this was certainly a great, uh, a great example of uh, some of radio's best work. Um, of course, uh, Enoch Arden, uh, if, if you're wondering, uh, was actually a, uh, it was uh, uh, not the name, of, of course, of the character in the story. It was, uh, Enoch Arden uh, is uh, from a uh, British uh, narrative poem uh, published in 1864. Uh, by uh, Tennyson, when he was English, uh, English, England's poet laureate, and uh, uh, it was about a uh, a man who disappeared at sea for ten years and came back to find his wife had assumed he was dead, and who had uh, remarried. So that's the reason for the name of this uh, particular episode. Well, we turn now to listener comments and feedback, and we actually got quite a few here. Um, between the, between our recording of Sherlock Holmes and our recording of, uh, uh, today's episode. And, uh, so I'm gonna go through those. I'll listen to the great detectives of old time radio every day. It's a great site. Uh, best podcast ever. Still going strong. Uh, the podcast is wonderful. I myself am a big fan of old time radio and this podcast is so far my favorite. Adam does a great job and has uh, great knowledge of the shows he presents to his audience every weekday. I would recommend this podcast to anyone. Great podcast consistently, uh, well done. And that was from Justin, by the way. This one, a great podcast consistently well done, bringing the best of OTR detectives to a new ge- uh, generation. And then great podcast, one of my constant favorites. And Val writes in, Great Detectives of Old Time Radio has been my favorite podcast for over two years. I love the fact that there's a different show for every weekday, enjoy hearing Adam's commentary, and still, after all these months, have a crush on uh, Johnny Dollar, (laughs) even with all the changes in actors. Uh, And then, uh, I listen all day at work to old time radio shows. Great Detectives is always my favorite, mostly due to the host, Adam, who adds interesting extra info and experienced insight. Thanks for all your hard work. I bought the app, and it makes it even easier to find the shows. And Mary says, uh, this is my escape, listening to all of the different detective shows. Johnny Dollar, Nero Wolf, and anything with Dick Powell are my favorite. It's uh, so nice to have someone putting these on. Well, thanks so much for all your nice comments. They're greatly appreciated. And I appreciate votes on Podcast Alley, with or without comments, as uh, it's definitely helped to promote our show. So encourage everyone to cast their votes at podcastalley.com. GreatDetectives.net. Now, speaking of the app, if you have the app or a premium site, I've added another show that um, I'm pretty much down to 
short shows, you know, two, three, you know, I think, you know, maybe four or five episodes, uh, you know, I've pretty much listed, decided on, on whether I'll do, uh, all of the shows that have got, you know, fairly large number of episodes. But I've added another show to the list of those, Hollywood Mystery Time. And, uh, I will put an unhosted episode of that as kind of a preview for, uh, those of you who have the app or a premium site. Uh, but that will actually do it for today. Uh, if you have a comment, send it to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-4783. And follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Well, we'll be back on Monday with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. And then join us back here on Friday for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.